And our next speaker is Jane Sloan. Jane is the Executive Director of International Women's Development Agency, an organisation that works in partnership with community-based organisations around Asia-Pacific to implement programs designed to improve the lives of women and girls. Jane has previously held executive positions for Marie Stopes International, World Vision, AusAid, AusTrade, as founding CEO of the Social Entrepreneurs Network and as general manager of the Sydney Media Centre for the Sydney Olympics. In 2005, Jane was awarded an Asia Pacific Business Women's Council Women of Distinction Award and a 2005 Churchill Fellowship to improve humanitarian emergency responses models for Australia and the region after the Australian tsunami. In 2007, she was granted an Endeavour, an Endeavour Professional Award to pilot a project to increase Pacific women's political participation at local and national levels. Jane is one of the 75 Australians trained by Al Gore as a climate change messenger. Please welcome Jane. I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of this land. I'd also like to pay respect to elders both past and present of the Kulin Nation and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians present. Over the last week, there's been much debate over the impact of Jermaine Greer's book, The Female Eunuch, fueled by an article by Louis Naura in the monthly magazine. I was thinking about the seminal influences in my early life and that the first record I bought was Helen Reddy's I Am Woman, Hear Me Roar, a song to set me on the path of advocating for women's rights if ever there was one. I bought this soon after I joined the YWCA and both the music and the experience of being at the Y affirmed me, built my self-confidence and gave me a sense of possibility in my place in the world. By then, the female eunuch had been the wake-up call for countless women who made radical changes to their lives. Greer's bawdy humour, an intelligent, brave and impassioned call for women to make their own life on their own terms was compelling. Women took up new careers and new relationships, started managing money themselves, challenged laws and the culture of sexual harassment. On International Women's Day this year, Greer wrote, Every new generation of women struggles to define itself. There is no need for today's women to march to a 40-year-old feminist drum. The feminist revolution has not failed. It is yet to begin. Its ground troops are fast developing the skills and muscle that will be necessary if we are to vanquish corporate power and rescue our small planet for humanity. I was curious thus to read the responses to Louis Nauer's own polemic, and I was fascinated to read the range of issues and perspectives that it attracted. One particular exchange caught my attention on the ABC's The Drum Unleashed blog site. Jason wrote, as to the modern woman being oppressed, I for one am tired of this old record. There's not a single university in Australia that would deny a woman entrance. I'm a middle, class white male that has worked for the majority of his life in a female dominated world, education. Yes, business is dominated by us, but no one helped us get there. We don't have support groups. We don't have governments taking care of us. We are just meant to shut up and put up. We get ahead because we put in what is necessary to get there. We don't ride along on skin color, gender or sexuality. Maybe it's time all the rest of you did the same. Maybe then you'll be a true equal. Miffy wrote back, Jace, honey, as a middle-class white male, you do ride along on skin colour and gender. I assume you don't have children. Curiously, you haven't mentioned anything about the division of labour in holding down a paid job, running a household and caring for children. No, I don't just mean helping out now and then when it suits not to mention trying to put in what is necessary, attending the compulsory breakfast meeting that the boss has called when the childcare centre hasn't opened yet, or working back late to finish that project when working against the deadline of picking children up from the childcare centre before it closes. Maybe a wife does all that. 
In one of her later books, White Feller Jump Up, Greer closes with the command, and it is a command, sit on the ground, damn you, sit on the ground. This isn't to do, as Naura suggests, to sit at the feet of Greer, the shabby, witheringly old feminist, and hear her polemic, but rather it's an invitation to sit and listen to Aboriginal people on their own terms and territory, and in their own time. I remember going to meet a group of Aboriginal women who were excited about the opening of a new cultural centre in their desert space. They invited me to go fishing with them, and I had that sense of sitting on the ground, watching and chilling out, listening and learning. I continued to follow the progress of this cultural centre through the woman who was appointed to manage it. The mining company funding the cultural centre organised a big launch, and the Aboriginal men and women on whose land it was organised cross-cultural tours as an immersion experience in their own cultural and environmental ways and practices. The whole community was excited about the opportunity to sell their art and craft and to stage performances and organise tours for the steady flow of visitor traffic. Fifteen months later, a new mine manager needed to find savings in his budget, so he pulled the money committed to the cultural centre and it was soon forced to close. The community was devastated. Several young men committed suicide, others commenced binge drinking, many slumped into listlessness, and the number of rapes and the amount of domestic violence increased dramatically. The community had lost trust, lost purpose, lost hope. Some of the women organised themselves into night patrols to keep themselves and their children safe. Others took their children to Darwin to start school away from the violence while others formed a group to advocate for improved health, health, health conditions and for federal funding for the cultural centre. And eventually they got their cultural centre back on safer ground and in the interim, the women had kept their families as safe as possible and their children educated and cared for. This scenario plays itself out in similar ways in so many communities in Pacific countries where the issues are very much the same. When I was in PNG a few years ago on a leadership fellowship that was partly sponsored by several mining companies, we were taken on a tour of a mine operation support services for those working for the company. I saw a group of women watching us from the sidelines on one of these visits. Come and sit with us, sister, they called out to me. So I did, and they called out to more women to come and sit with us. They told me of the lack of any health facilities to help with pregnancy-related health issues, the lack of health treatment and support for malaria and other diseases and for HIV testing. They spoke of the rampant domestic violence, of the number of women who'd committed suicide because they felt there was no other way out, of the lack of a place to meet as a supportive space to talk and to share their burden. The women talked of their plan to create such a space and to also introduce adult literacy circles to give other women a greater chance of getting a job and thus greater independence. We need to sit and listen, to seek out ways to be in solidarity with women and to know what we can do that will change the equation for them and their families. <laughs>